to understand whatever I'm going to discuss uh, in next 45 minutes or so, uh, you need to understand variables. You need to understand variables from two perspectives. You need to understand variables from two perspectives. First perspective is uh, from their functional relationship point of view. Now, when I say functional relationship point of view, that means every variable has its position in the framework. Right, so you need to identify what is the position of this variable and position of the variable in that framework of relationship that really determines everything. So you need to understand what is the position of the variable. Now, in any, any research, we are interested in something. We are interested in something and whatever we are interested in, that we call it as outcome variable. You just heard uh, before, outcome variable, response variable, statisticians call it dependent variable, some people call it effect variable. So we are actually interested in that variable. So any study that you take, regardless of the study design, you have to have at least one outcome variable. You can't say I'm not interested in anything. You are interested in something, at least one thing, so that is your outcome variable, right? An outcome variable would, di would differ from question to question, right? And another, and then you have exposure variable. Exposure variable, exposure variable is any characteristic which has potential to influence the outcome, right? Even if you take one outcome variable, there will be n number of exposure variables, right? Actually, we do not, for any, for any outcome, we do not have exhaustive list of exposure variables. We don't know all that. We only know very limited exposure variables, and even what we know as limited, you can't collect data on all the known exposure variables. So in research, we deal with very limited exposures, right? So that is why in any research, you cannot complete determine any phenomena, any outcome completely, because you don't have access to all the, first of all, you don't have knowledge about all the exposure variables. Even if you know, have some knowledge, you can't collect data on them. And if once you have not collected data on them, you can't say anything about those, right? So those are, so exposure variable. But any research you take, any, if you take epidemiological research, if you take epidemiological research, then we are interested in role of one factor on one outcome. We are interested in knowing the role of, what is the role of this intervention, this drug on this outcome? What is the role of uh, smoking on hypertension? Right? So we are interested in one exposure. And all remaining exposures, all remaining exposures which are of not interest to us, that's what the previous speaker called nuisance variables. That's what he said, nuisance variable. Those are the exposures. They are, they are nuisance in the sense we are not interested in, in them. Right? They are nuisance in the sense that we are not at all interested in what, what is their role on the outcome, right? And also, it is not that presence or absence of nuisance, nuisance factor. It is basically imbalance of nuisance factors. A nuisance factor may be present there, right? But as long as there is a balance, as long as there is a balance in the two groups, I mean, we don't need to worry about it. We, we'll, we'll come to that, right? So any outcome you take, whether infectious diseases or non-infectious diseases or any aspect of health outcome, there is no single factor or single exposure, right? So exposure also are known by different names. Some people call it exposure, factor, the statisticians call it independent variable. So those, some people call it covariate. I mean, all those different names you have. But basic thing is they have potential to influence the outcome, right? And whatever we are not interested in, they become other factors. They become other factors and other factors, either nuisance factor or you call it confounding factor or you call it effect modifier, whatever. So there are various various ways, various names, right? And as somebody said in that uh, you need to prepare your data. You need to prepare your data means what? You need to identify, you need to identify are there actually, you collect data on so many of, so many of the variables. All of them will not become nuisance variables. So you need to identify which ones are nuisance variables and I should be concerned with them. I should deal with them. So you need to identify 
you need to, it's not the presence or absence, but you need to identify that out of all of these nuisance variables, which one I need to deal with so that I know the pure relationship between exposure and outcome, which is my objective, right? So th that is from the position of, in the framework. So first thing that you need to understand about variables is from their functional relationship point of view. Second is from measurement and analysis point of view. Now outcome variable you have, now say for example, somebody is interested in uh, knowing, some, somebody has outcome as <coughs> mortality, death, then for him death is the outcome. And maybe cardiovascular disease, maybe the exposure. Those who have CVD are, in them, risk of death is more. That's what his hypothesis, that's what he wants to know. So CVD is exposure and mortality is the outcome. Somebody else says, no, 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 I am interested in uh, CVD as the outcome. So for him, exposure could be hypertension. Somebody who's hypertensive is more likely to uh, be, isn't it? So CVD for him, it was exposure, but for now, for this person, it is outcome. Third person may say, no, 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 actually hypertension is outcome for me. And I want to the role of smoking on hypertension. So basically it depends. It depends from question to question. What is your outcome variable? So an outcome variable for somebody may be exposure for in some other setting. So it, it depends actually. But then you have to collect data on them, right? So out, so these are the only three variables. So in any research, any discipline, any level, we deal only with three types of variables. There is no fourth variable any discipline, any research, <laughs> we deal only with three kinds of variables. There is no fourth variable. First variable is outcome variable. Second variable is your exposure of interest. And, and third category of variables are, though they are also exposure of variables, but they are of, expo they are of no interest to us, right? And if you don't deal with them, so in research what we do is we spend more time and energy on th something in which we are not interested. We are not, we are interested only in one exposure, but we spend so much energy on so many nuisance variables, right? So, so th this is what you have, now outcome variable. Now your outcome variable, see we collect data on all of these, right? We collect data on all of these, right? And also, but when we go to the analysis, when we come to, at the stage of analysis, we may analyze the data, not in the same manner as we collected, we may convert it, right? We may transform it and then, like say, for example, birth weight of newborn, those are numbers. But when you analyze, you say, no, no, I, have, I don't want to analyze as birth weight. I want to analyze as low birth weight and normal birth weight. So you have converted that and then you analyze that as an outcome variable. So it depends at the time of analysis, what is the form of your variable that you have, right? So, so basically your outcome variable, it can be categorical, yes, no type. Hypertension, yes, no, death, yes, no, low birth weight, normal birth weight, categorical, or it can have it can have more than two categories, say response, no response, mild response, moderate response, complete, it can have any kinds of, right? So your outcome variable can be categorical. In some situation, your outcome variable can be quantitative, birth weight of newborn, systolic blood pressure, heart rate, anything, right? So this is, it can be quantitative, or your outcome variable can be time to response time to event, like just in the previous session, it was told about time to something, isn't it? Time to event. So your outcome can be time to event, which is basically combination of this and this. So time to event is basically you taken as outcome when you assign importance to the time at which event occurs. Now, somebody gets cured at two months and, and another person gets cured at six months, both are cured but they are not the same cure. Somebody dies at two months, another person dies at two years, both are deaths, but they are not same deaths. So whenever you assign, whenever give importance to the time at which event occurs, that is time to event, right? And that's where you use sensor data and all those kinds of things. So, so your outcome can be categorical, it can be quantitative, it can be time to event. Your exposure variable can be categorical, let's say gender categorical, Smoker, smoker, non-smoker can be categorical. Drug A, drug B can be categorical, right? So it can be categorical or it can be quantitative. Let's say BMI can be quantitative, age can be quantitative. Your, your exposure can be quantitative or even it can be uh, time-dependent covariate. 
your exposure may vary with time it's not that all exposures are fixed right it may vary with time so your exposure can be categorical quantitative time to event and your other factors which are also exposures but of no interest they also can be any one of them so basically all analysis is combination of this that's all all analysis that you t that we do is basically combination of this right and you have different methods and all that so we, you need to understand variables from two perspective one from their functional relationship and second from measurement point of view now when we do the analysis in health research when we do the analysis there are only three kinds of analysis there is no fourth there is no fourth analysis one analysis is you analyze one column of your excel sheet and do whatever that's one variable you call it uni variable or one variable right in regression you may call it as a two variables and by one dependent one independent as univariate sometimes you may call it but actually you are using two variables so any analysis where you, you are using only one column of your excel sheet let's say univariate bivariate it when you are using two columns right you are using two columns and when you use two columns you know your outcome exposure just we discussed how many forms we have so you have these kinds of various combinations you can have quantitative quantitative you can have bmi plus versus blood sugar right you want to see relationship or you can have categorical categorical maybe obesity versus diabetes right same question but in different form you can have categorical versus quantitative you can have obese non obese and you want to compare mean mean blood sugar right or you can have time to event versus either categorical or quantitative so these are the kind of bivariate analysis that 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 we usually we do and then after that you have multivariate or multivariable so in multivariable what in multivariable again you have whole lot of methods right but we will not discuss all of them we will discuss only a few of them right now if you just just look at this just look at this uh, relationship between mother's height birth weight mother's weight birth weight so birth weight is the basically the outcome so whenever so whenever somebody says relationship between this and this immediately you should think in terms of exposure outcome what is exposure what is outcome right so most of the time we know what is exposure what is outcome because for that subject knowledge is required so if, if somebody says smoking is related there is a strong relationship between smoking and hypertension then we know that smokers are smoker is smoking is exposure hypertension is outcome those who smoke there is increased risk of getting hypertension it's not other way that those become hypertensive they are more likely to pick up smoking so that's our common sense but most situation we we know this but not all situations subject knowledge is required in in many situation so here you say quantitative outcome here you say categorical outcome here you see time to cancer time to event right so this is what we, are, we will discuss in the second part so here once your outcome is quantitative to know the cause and effect relationship but as it was mentioned in previous session we use one kind of regression right multiple linear regression here you will use a logistic regression which was also mentioned here you will use cox regression time to event so these are the three these are the three methods very briefly we'll discuss there are a whole lot of others that we are not going to discuss now let's come to the topic correlation and regression what is correlation correlation is basically you have two variables you have two variables and you are looking at relationship between the two variables right now the, these two variables can be in different forms can be categorical can be quantitative right can be categorical quantitative but usually when your both the variables are quantitative you use correlation right so correlation will be between age and blood sugar or say a bmi and blood sugar but when your both the variables are categorical you use you don't use the word correlation even though it is correlation you use the word association you use the word association right like let's say wearing helmet and head injury right wearing helmet and head injury you use the word association even though you are looking at relationship between two variables but the word that you use is association and there are various measures of correlation and association 
So what are the measures of correlation that, that anyway you know this, but just for the sake of saying this. So what is correlation? Finding the relationship between two quantitative variables without being able to infer causal relationship. See, ultimately you want to know, you want to establish causal relationship. You want to know, is this factor causally related to this or not, right? But to establish that, you have to see real correlation first because this is necessary condition. This is necessary condition. Two variables, if they are not correlated, they cannot be it, their relationship cannot be causal. So this is the necessary condition, correlation. This has to be first. So two variables correlated may or may not be causally related, right? But, some, but two variables not, not correlated, there is no question of causal relationship. So this is a necessary condition for a variable to be causally related to an outcome. So correlation, and here what you want to know, uh, that to what extent the two variables co-vary. This is what we are told, to what extent the two variables are, the two variables co-vary. Now, out of all the statistical methods which have been developed, Correlation coefficient is one of the method which has been maximum misused. So whether you know uh, when to use correlation or not, at least you should know when you should not use correlation coefficient, right? When you should not use correlation coefficient. So uh, again, Dr. Patil, he mentioned about Douglas G. Altman book, Medical Research Red Color book. Chapter number 14, he, is, he has written very clearly what are the misuses of correlation. Right, so just read that, and I have taken from that book only, very excellent book, so as he recommended, if you get time, please read that book. So correlation is a statistical technique used to determine the degree or to extent to which the two variables are related, right, they are, they, they co-vary. And uh, your, your relationship could be, the, pat the relationship could be positive or could be negative, we are talking about linear relationship, we are not talking of curvy linear relationship. As uh, in the first session it was told, the, the two variables, there may be, because when he was talking about symmetry, then he showed first part this kind of symmetry, other part other kind of symmetry. So th there may be correlation, but may not be linear, may not be linear. So in such a situation, when you do the correlation, you may get zero. He mentioned it very clearly, right? So your relationship can be positive or it can be it can be, can be negative. Positive means both vary in the same direction, right? Negative means if one goes up, other goes down, right? So there is an inverse kind of relationship. No relationship means uh, nothing happens to other, other variable, uh, whatever happens to this, right? So there is no relationship. So, th so these are the kind of uh, relationships you have. So any analysis that we do, our first step is we reduce our Excel sheet. We reduce the data. Like suppose you have two variables, smoking and let's say hypertension. So, and you have so 100 individuals, so you have smoking, hypertension. So how do you reduce without losing any data? You make a two by two table. You make a two by two table. You're not losing any data. You have just summarized that. Same thing you do here in a scatter plot. When you have two quantitative variables, you're not reducing anything. Just look at the whole thing in a reduced manner in a scatter plot. Right? In categorical, you come to contingency table. In quantitative, you make it a, a scatter plot. Right? And you can have this kind of relationship, maybe may, may linear, maybe uh, this positive, negative relationship. Now here you see there is a relationship. It's not independent. There is a relationship, but which is non-linear. Which is non-linear. So that, that's what he was, he was saying. So these are, and how strong the relationship is, it, it depends on the scatter, how scattered the points are. Less scattered, I mean, a more strong relationship the variable would be. So these are, these are the basic things that you have know, you, you know. Now, so just, just see this data. So looking at this visually, what kind of relationship do you see? You see something like this? Isn't it? Something like this, some positive relationship you see here, right? Like here, say two variables, age of car and reliability. So look at the pattern, look at the pattern. So you see some negative relationship, right? And you don't see all the dots on the same line. If you see all the dots on the same line, 
then it that shows a stronger relationship or perfect relationship right here you don't find any pattern visually so that's why you say no relationship but these are all visual these are all subjective you we we need an objective measure we need to quantify this right we need to quantify so that for a given data whether you say or he says or somebody else says we all three of us are saying the same thing right so for that we need some measure and there are these two measures pearson's commonly used pearson's correlation coefficient and spearman's rank correlation coefficient pearson's are when your both the variables are normally distributed spearman's are when one or both are non normally distributed or you have ordinal kinds of kinds of variable right so so basically that's what you do and uh, I, the range is from minus 1 to plus see you you know all this i don't need to everybody knows this range is from minus 1 to plus correlation coefficient is a vector quantity it has sign and it has number right the sign tells you the direction of relationship and number tells you the strength of relationship right so if if x y z between x and y you have 0.7 and between x and z you have minus 0.7 right so strength is same but the direction is not the same right so so you have to look at both the things sign as well as as well as the this one and some people have categorized kind of thing like this kind of thing you also see in case of agreement right for kappa, kappa statistic when you do you see they have they have categorized this right they have converted this quantitative into qualitative into kind of ordinal so this is what the kind of thing they have suggested uh, less than 0.25 weak correlation could be positive or negative moderate correlation strong correlation or perfect correlation and th these are basically just just ways to calculate and i'm not going to uh, discuss about it this is an example and that that's what is basically he was saying about this covariance you have covariance in the num numerator and the two standard deviations in the denominator you calculate and this all this i'll skip so here one example is 0.759 so positive and you can see what this number is so good correlation here you have take another example you can have so basically if you can have good correlation negative right take another example now so so next is when you take spearman's rank correlation spearman's rank correlation is basically non parametric because the name as the name suggests rank correlation so to calculate there is some formula and in that formula not the individual values but their corresponding ranks go inside for calculation right so which one is more powerful pearson or spearman's rank based methods are always less powerful right because you lose data suppose you have three observations 100 1000 and 10000 then when you do rank based 100 1000 and 10000 don't go 1 2 3 will go inside right so you lose lot of lot of information right so th these methods are not so if you have two variables and if you find one variable is non normally distributed try to transform this into normal normality so that you could use pearson's correlation not only for correlation for anything for any analysis any analysis like when you do statistical test when you do statistical test and if you find a variable non normal don't go for non parametric straight away non parametric method should not be method of choice they should only be when you are unable to transform into normality then you have no option but to use this right so then you use these kinds of methods and this is how this is basically just the steps told to you how how rank correlation is calculated and you can use when your one variable is ordinal right so here you see calculation is done and poor correlation so basically correlation coefficients the pearson's correlation coefficient spearman's rank correlation coefficient and like when many times what we see many times what we see people decide on the correlation coefficient based on its p value right and as you know they are all sensitive to your numbers whenever you talk in terms of p value whenever you talk in terms of p value that means you are using a standard error 
and that means you are using n right so then that's not the right thing to do that's not the right thing to do so see here a correlation coefficient of 0.6 and coming from small observation so good correlation 0.6 is relatively good correlation as compared to 0.3 below but since it is coming from small observation you see not significant why not significant because in the interval you see zero present null value present right in the interval you see null value present so not significant but here if you see large smaller correlation coefficient large number and here you see you can't say that this correlation is more important right you can't say this correlation more important because it is statistically significant or confidence interval does not include null value so they are all all inferential based inferential methods are sensitive to numbers correlation is not an exception correlation also is basically sensitive to number now just let us see some examples let us see some examples where correlation people use correlation co just coefficient now say for example you have 10 variables you have 10 variables now doing analysis is very easy you just mention 10 variables and say correlation it will give you correlation matrix it will give you correlation matrix so if you have 10 variables and if you specify uh, let's say a uh, pearson's correlation coefficient you will have how many correlation coefficients you will have 10 c2 45 correlation coefficients you can have 45 correlation coefficients right and then you start <laughs> applying p value and say by chance something somewhere will be si significant and you just pick up those that is that is not ex acceptable that is why they will many times if you present this kind of data they will tell you do bone ferroni correction they will tell you do bone ferroni correction so this this is one example second example is uh, two variables repeatedly recorded over time right you have two variables you have recorded today you have recorded tomorrow you have recorded right so serial measurements serial measurements so this is another example of correlation coefficient now another example is uh, you have basically heterogeneous group in your sample you have some pregnant woman and in them the relationship between two variables and you have another sub sample in the same hypertensive men in them two and we have combined the two and looked at the correlation coefficient these are the situations where people have used correlation coefficient now percentage body fat for males and females they are different now two two methods measuring same quantity two methods say for example uh, i want to find out uh, say agreement studies i have a weighing machine I have a weighing machine. I want to find out how good this weighing machine is with reference to a standard weighing machine. So I take a group of 100 individuals and on each of the individuals I have paired observations. Standard machine and new machine. Standard machine, new machine. Do the correlation coefficient and I get one and I say perfect agreement. I get one and I say perfect agreement. So this is agreement studies. Now next is before after before after right so before after studies before you have and after right so same individual same individual same variable in two different situations so same individual same variable in two situations situation can be time situations can be methods of measurement situations can be anything so this the first one was i mean earlier one was agreement was two two different measurements and this one is uh, same measurement but at two different time points right so so here again this example of correlation coefficient another one is height at age 5 and height at age whatever age 25 is there any correlation so this these are the examples given in Douglas Douglas Altman book that in such situations you should these are the misuses of correlation you should not use correlation coefficient so first one is extreme of data dredging, second one is spurious correlation involving time, third one is restricted sampling of individuals, mixed sample, assessing agreement. You will see a lot of published papers, lot of published papers where agreement they say based on correlation. Suppose my new weighing machine, my indicator is always at 5. My indicator is always at 5. Then for every individual, the observed measured weight will be 5 kg more than the actual weight. 
and when you make a scatter plot you will get a straight line you will get a straight line and cutting on five y axis if it is y axis is your new new uh, new one new machine so everything will be on a straight line so r is equal to 1 and it's a perfect agreement right so you see lot of examples of the of this kind of misuses relating part to whole bottom line is bottom line is you need two two variables two different variables if you're measuring height at age 5 and height at age 20 so variable is the same where are the two variables so you have to have two variables two characteristics on the same individual at one time point right two characteristics right it's not the two columns but two different characteristics one characteristic can be height other one can be weight right but two different characteristics on the same individual so then you can use correlation coefficient otherwise you can't use correlation coefficient right so but correlation correlation is basically necessary condition to go for causal relationship and correlation you use when both are both are basically quantitative now what happens when both are categorical when both are categorical then what do you do in case of quantitative you did a scatter plot and then you quantified in terms of correlation coefficient in case of categorical you make contingency table and not the correlation coefficient you calculate measure of association depending upon your study design you calculate measure of association depending upon your study design if your study design is either cross-sectional or case control you calculate odds ratio if your study design is prospective that means either cohort study or clinical trial then you calculate risk ratio risk difference right so you have only two kinds of study design one is prospective other is non-prospective right so in non-prospective you calculate odds ratio in prospective you calculate risk ratio there are two measures absolute measure relative measures right so risk difference is absolute measure we are taking difference risk ratio or relative risk that is relative measure because numerator denominator right so there you calculate all that right so let us come to the regression part in regression part uh, or in, in the multivariable part you have two kinds of methods one is where you have targeted outcome where you have targeted outcome that means predefined dependent variable right and other category of method you have non-targeted outcome you don't have a dependent variable right so all your for example cluster analysis there is no dip target variable so they will come under so under this kind of methods so all of all of these there are a whole lot of methods there are a whole lot of methods but we will just very briefly discuss uh, these three because these three are basically determined by your form of dependent variable these three are basically form of dependent variable right so here also so like say artificial neural network or or machine learning all of these are what they are basically they, they all come under targeted outcome in this what are you doing whatever may be your method in targeted outcome what are you doing your training supervised learning all isn't it even in regression what are you doing supervised learning you have a dependent variable you have a dependent variable and you have set of independent or whatever you call them right and all you're trying to do is your modeling your all you're trying to do is is modeling trial and error and you stop at a time where your whatever you have developed fits into the whatever your data says right so all you're trying to do is same thing modeling you're doing or what what Taylor does what Taylor does same thing you're doing Taylor also takes all your measurements all these variables right and then he stitches a quote or whatever which fits you right so that that's what that's what he does but here uh, this is not like Taylor Taylor stitches quote for you but here our objective is not that this model is to be used for this particular sample but this has to be used for outside the sample right so whatever modeling we do here as a statistician those are like uh, stitching ready-made charts not for an individual but for most of the individuals so right so, so that is what is is done here so we have we'll discuss these three basically a family regression linear logistic and cox we are not going to discuss all of this we are not going to discuss all of this 
like classification and regression tree, again people have used, we have, they have combined this method with this. They have combined, so basically classification and regression tree, if you have no inverted tree, inverted tree, right? Inverted tree and uh, do you, you identify the cluster of variables. You identify cluster of variables and then you use regression analysis, right? Regression analysis have been used in medical medical research. In they have been used, but they are much away from the truth. They are much much away from the truth. Now, when you do regression analysis, we'll, we'll come to that. Have you seen any patient going? To, have you seen when patients go to doctor? Do they do they go to doctor with only one condition present? They go with multiple condition. उसका एज भी ऐसा है जेंडर भी ऐसा है स्मोकिंग भी करता है हाइपरटेंशन भी है मल्टीपल कंडीशंस बट वेन वी डू रिग्रेशन वी आर एज्यूमिंग दे आर ऑल इंडिपेंडेंट वेन वी डू रिग्रेशन वी एज्यूम दैट दीज वेरिएबल्स आर इंडिपेंडेंट दे डोंट टॉक टू ईच अदर दैट डज नॉट हैपन इन इन रियल लाइफ राइट सो वेन यू इन द क्लिनिक वेन सम पेशेंट्स गो दे गो विथ एन नंबर ऑफ एब नॉर्मेलिटीज ए पर्सन में हैव टू एब नॉर्मेलिटी ए पर्सन में हैव थ्री एब नॉर्मेलिटी सो क्लस्टर ऑफ cluster of abnormalities right so then doctor decides that somebody who has these three present what is the risk somebody who have five present what is the risk so classification and regression tree is the method it identifies it identify the cluster in terms of all these risk factors and then you use one of, one of these regression so people have done that that kind of that kind of methods so now again when we do regression or the multivariate there are two kinds of things one is statistical and second is epidemiological one is statistical other one is epidemiological when we talk of epidemiological then our in epidemiology or in health research our focus is exposure outcome we may be collecting data on multiple variables but our question remains bivariate our question remains even if we do multivariate analysis our question remains bivariate we want to know pure relationship between exposure and outcome adjusting for the effect of other other nuisance variable so we are doing multivariate but our focus is bivariate we are interested in knowing independent role of exposure and outcome right so that is a that is a kind of thing so in epidemiology it is outcome exposure confounder effect modifier how to identify a variable is confounder or an effect might modifier we'll see that and if a variable is a confounder how to deal with it if a variable is a confound is a effect modifier what to do with deal with this many papers you see many papers see see all third factors see uh, nuisance factors are third factors first is outcome second is exposure and they come under the category of third factor all third factors are not nuisance factors all third factors are not nuisance factor they may be intermediate outcomes right so you you need you need to understand this subject you need to discuss with the subject person right you need to discuss with suppose somebody is interested somebody is interested in knowing role of saturated fat on let's say cvd saturated fat on cvd cardiovascular disease so exposure is saturated fat outcome is cardiovascular disease right now in between in between comes let's say obesity or comes hypertension right so these are outcome variables saturated fat influences bmi and bmi influences cvd saturated fat influences this so these are intermediate outcomes right but intermediate outcomes are third factors so you, if you adjust for this if you adjust for this then that kind of analysis is known as kalidas analysis kalidas analysis means you are cutting the same branch on which you are sitting right you are doing harm to yourself so you need to it is not that just take any variable and do regression understanding is important you need to discuss so that's where the role of clinic comes clinic means there is interaction clinic means there is some interaction so now i know that all i did was clinic so <laughs> so you need to identify you need to identify my third variable is it a confounder is it an effect modifier or is it an intermediate outcome if it is an intermediate outcome usko haath jodiye kuch nahi karna hai 
If it is an effect modifier, you need to adjust. And uh, you, you, if it is a confounder, you need to adjust using regression methods. And if it is an effect modifier, you, need, you don't need to adjust. You don't need to adjust, right? If you adjust, if you effect modifier, if you adjust, then you will see no relationship, right? It is something like uh, your half part of body in the freezer and half outside you, feel you are feeling comfortable, right? So, so, so that kind of, so how to identify, is it a confound third variable? So preparation is more important. Prepare, your data may be of very high quality, your rice may be of very high quality, but if you have not cleaned it, not prepared it well, your output will not be good. So, so, so we'll, see, we'll see all that. Statistical models are those where all your factors are independent variables or covariates. You have not identified one a priori. A priori, you have not identified identified one as your as your co as your covariate. Okay, but I started a bit late. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry I'm not able to cover this, but I'll try to finish this. Because any time I see organizers coming this side, I know they are coming, <laughs> coming towards me. So one, I was looking this side, but then I saw her. Anyway, so see, uh, regression, regression, this is what your, is your usual general framework of any regression. You have outcome, you have x1, x2, x3, and in all regression, whatever may be regression, basically you want to estimate the unknowns. You want to estimate this, these unknowns, right? Suppose you have, you have, one x, you have one x and one y, that means two variables. To solve two variables, we learned in schools, class six, the eighth or whatever, we can have two equations and solve, solve isn't it? Right, because two, un, two unknowns, so two equations. Three unknowns, three equations. So up to three, we can do all that calculation. But beyond three, it becomes very difficult. That's where you have to come and and use other methods to estimate this. So this is all about estimation. So basically first you define your functional form. So functional form in case of outcome is this, and you estimate your, est estimate your coefficients. So that's what you do in, in regression, right? Re doing regression analysis is the easiest part. Any software you take, all you need to define which regression you want to use. Then it will ask you where is dependent, and then it will ask you where are the independent. You click, 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 and then you define which independents are quantitative or categorical, and then you say OK button, and you get the relation. So doing analysis is not an, it's not basically something, right? But you need to understand, and what is the interpretation of this? So those things you need to understand. Epidemiological models, as I told you, you have these kinds of things. So general framework. If your outcome is quantitative, multiple linear, categorical, again, categorical depends, is it binary, is it multi-categorical, is it ordinal? So you have different kinds of, kinds of regression, right? So simplest is your binary. But simplest is your binary, where, where you use binary logistic regression, right? Okay, binary logistic regression or multiple logistic regression, depending upon how many variables you have. More than two category, multinomial, ordinal, then you use uh, time to event, Cox regression you use. So these are the three regressions commonly used in health, health research. So very quickly, let us go through this. What are the common uses of regression? See, one, one is basically uh, identify prognostic factors while adjusting for potential confounders, adjust for differences in baseline, baseline characteristics, right? And the baseline characteristics that you can do in uh, RCT you can do, isn't it? You can do in RCT. Even in propensity score matching, you are doing all that regression, right? That is nothing but by doing, when you're doing propensity score matching, all you're trying to, to achieve as a kind of, we are creating a situation as if the two groups are matched and, right? So you're basically matching on confounders. Matching on, so it is not the, it is not the presence or absence of nuisance factor or third factor, but it is imbalance. Suppose I do a clinical trial, I have group one, I have group two, and I know, I know that smoking can be a nuisance factor or a stage of disease can be a nuisance factor. Nuisance in the nuisance factors are those where the apps, where having this or that, they have advantage or disadvantage with respect to outcome. That's all. 
right? So if I find that proportion of patients in this group and this group having stage three is same, 40% are smokers here, 40% are smokers here, then I don't need to worry. Nuisance factors are those, nuisance factors are those where somebody should not raise the finger at the end that look whatever results you are saying, it could be because of this, right? So if you're both the groups, if you have 40%, 40% smokers, then whatever result you get cannot be attributed to difference in smokers, right? Even though smoking is nuisance, it is present, but it is actually the imbalance. So you need to see imbalance of this. So you, you have to do all of all of this. I will, I will not. There are var various model building strategies, isn't it? Commonly, <coughs> the, these are the commonly used methods. Enter method, right? So when you build the model, usually it is not based on just a statistical alone. It is based on, when you do just statistical base, that is black box. That means you are not using your brain. Machine is deciding. Machine is deciding what to take, what not to take. So use both. Use both your clinical sense and your statistical combined this. So that is what it is. And these are various kinds of methods. Commonly, people use st stepwise approach. Stepwise means both. It has features of both forward and backward. So I will not get into this. These are various methods of estimating this one. Least squares, maximum likelihood. Now. When you adjust for confounders, so I think I will skip all of this. I skip all of this, but let me let me go to. You can have this various <coughs> slides. Slides will be there. You can understand this. But let let me just spend just five minutes on identifying uh, how do you find out this nuisance factor is a confounder or effect modifier. So just I, because that's what will determine how to deal with that variable. So let me spend just five minutes on this. So see, what you need to do is, what you, so th this is an example. You have, so this is basically example of confounding and effect modification. So you have, this is example one. All you need to do is, you need to stratify, you need to say for example, uh, I want to find out relationship between smoking and hypertension. Then my third factor, if I take it as gender. So gender has two strata, male, female. So in this example, the third factor has three strata. Third factor has three strata. So what you do is, in each strata, in each strata, look at the relationship. So this is basically risk, risk ratio. So 1.4 in example A, stratum 1, 1.4, stratum 2, 1.8, stratum 3, 1.3. And crude means forget about the stratum. Ignore the stratum, you just take just two by two table. Just take two by two table and then see what is the what is the odds ratio or the risk ratio so here you see 1.2.5 right example 2 1.4 1.8 1.3 1.5 so to identify my third factor is a confounder or effect modifier you need to look at the strength of relationship in each strata of the third factor or the nuisance factor right and then see what uh, should i should it be, should i say confounder or effect modifier so that's what it is Example C, 1.4, 1.8, 0.2. Now, one point, anything more than one shows you relationship in one direction, risk factor, right? And something below one, it is saying on the other direction, protective factor. Let's say if we have coded like that, right? So, other kind of, so, so 1.4, 1.8, 1.3, say here. Now, what, what you do is, so the question is, is it, is it a conf confounder or is it an effect modifier? Your third factor can be neither confounder nor effect modifier, very happy situation. Or it can be confounder but not effect modifier. Or it can be effect modifier but not a confounder. Or it can be both. Then how to deal with it and how to identify this? So that's what we're discussing here. So what you do is you calculate visual average of the stratum specific risk ratio. So if you calculate visual average of 1.4, 1.8, 1.3, see this visual average, is it closer to the crude or not? Is it, it's not, isn't it? It's not closer to the crude. That means confounding is happening. That means confounding is happening, right? Effect modification, is the effect in these strata modified or not? It's not modified because here is a risk factor, here risk factor, here also risk factor, 
So direction of effect is consistent across the strata. So effect is not modified. But here you see the visual average is different from crude, right? So confounder, but not an effect modifier. Now come here, 1.4, 1.8, 1.3. Calculate the average, visual average. Is it closer to observed? Yes, isn't it? Is the effect modified in any of the strata? No, consistently more than one. So not an effect modifier. So not a confounder, not effect modifier. Look at this, 1.4, 1.8, 0.2. Uh, 0.2 means definitely effect modifier, right? But calculate the average, 1.4, 1.8, 1.2. Is it closer to 1.5? Looks like closer to 1.5, right? So it's an effect modifier, but not a confounder. Look at this, 1.4, 1.8, 0 0.2. So definitely effect modifier. But what about the average? Average also is different. So it is both effect modifier and, and confounder, right? Whenever your variable is effect modifier, do not use any statistical method to deal with it. You do stratified analysis. You see the relationship in this, you see the relationship in this, right? You don't adjust for it, right? Then your question of confounding becomes only academic, right? So this is what it is. Sorry. I think it is not coming, but so this is what, right? And when it is an effect modifier, then you use regression methods. Then use regression methods. Otherwise, you use, now see, again, there you have to apply the definition of confounder. What is a confounder? Confounder is a third factor. Confounder is a third factor linked to your exposure, and it is a predictor of outcome. If so, then it fits, fits into definition of confounder, then you adjust for it in the regression analysis. Now see this example. Would you say that definition is fit? Now my expo outcome is cancer, my risk factor is genetic marker. I want to see, my exposure is genetic marker, I want to see the role of genetic marker on cancer. And my third factor is smoking, right? Now this third factor is definitely a predictor of lung cancer. Smoking is definitely a predictor of cancer. There is, there is no doubt about it, right? But is there any demonstrated relationship between smoking and genetic factor? Those who have these kind of genetic things, they are more likely to smoke. Is there a kind of relationship? If there is no relationship, then this link is missing. Then you can't, then you can't adjust for it. Then what you should do is look at this relationship in two different strata, one among smokers, other among non-smokers. Don't combine the two. So do stratified analysis. So that is what it is. And I think I leave the slides here. And I'm sorry, I have not. Anyway, but I started late. That's OK. <laughs> but anyway, so if you have questions, we can take that. I have not, be have not been able to cover, but if you have questions, we can take this. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, let's say the data that has been collected consists of only ordinal values. And let's assume that uh, we have given questionnaires to the candidates. And they have answered in the uh, scale, good, bad, or something like that, yeah. uh, out of 5 or out of 10. Yes. Uh, let's assume that we have uh, such features, some 10 features. Yeah. So uh, in that case, like, how do we uh, establish relationship between the uh, uh, the features? That right. So basically, see, what he's saying is uh, there is a questionnaire. In that questionnaire, let's say there are 10 questions. And on each question, the response measured is not yes-no type, but it is on Likert scale. It is on Likert yeah, yeah, scale, correct. isn't it? Ranging yeah, yeah. from 1, 2, 3, 4. One may be, I mean, on lower side. Five Perfect. may be on the higher side. So Likert scale. Isn't it? Correct. These are basically like at a scale, right? And then what you may do is, what you may do is, you may have a questionnaire having 50 questions, and these 50 questions may come from five different domains, and you may want to analyze domain-wise also, mm -hmm. right? So what you do at the end is, you will have five domain scores. Right. You will have five domain scores, okay. and then you will have total score also. Fine, fine. Right? So this you convert into quantitative. So you deal with okay. this 
in right. a, as you will deal in a quantitative. So you will calculate mean score. Say, see, see so you calculate like this, isn't it? So you, when you're comparing, when you're comparing with group one and group two, then you will calculate mean. But suppose, suppose you're not comparing. You're not comparing, right? You have only one group. You have only one group. You have, let's say, 50, uh, 50, uh, 100 individuals. You have one group, 100 individuals, 10 items, right? Ranging from one to five. So every individual will get a score somewhere between 10 to, uh, between 100 individuals. So every indi individual will get from 100 to 500. Mm -hmm. If every individual say one, 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 to 100 hoga. If everyone says five, 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 to 500 hoga. So everybody will get total score somewhere between 100 to 500, right? And you have one, two, three, four, five. And one, two, three, four, five, they represent something. One is less maybe very bad. Mm -hmm. uh, two may be less bad. And five may be the best. Okay. You understand? Yeah, yeah, so this it. 100 hundred to 500, again, you divide into same kind of categories. And you label this, apply the same variable to this. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, right? sir. Makes so, sense. You, so then you do that. But when, if you're comparing, then you can use me as you can deal with them as quantitative yes yeah. sir very nice and uh, sir the same data let's say if we have to do some kind of classification i mean uh, let's say if there is a predictor variable yes based on these questionnaires i'll uh, come so can i use this data as a training data you can you know see training data is different training data is different see one is uh, if you're using this as a predictor mm -hmm. you're using this as a predictor then you're not going to use this as a quantitative no, no, see, what see, I'm ne ne never use a quantitative <coughs> variable, never use a quantitative variable in regression analysis. If you're using quantitative variable in regression analysis, right, so what do you get? You get, uh, suppose I use age as quantitative variable mm -hmm. as one of the x variable, mm -hmm. how many coefficients do I get? One, one coefficient right. I will get, isn't it? And what would they be the interpretation? That per unit change in age, this much unit of change in y, Mm. in the dependent variable, isn't it? Right. But will that be correct? One unit change, that means one year, of if age, age is mm. in year, so 10 to 11 is one year, and 10 to 11 and 51 to 52, both are not the same. Right. 10 to okay. 11 and 51 to 52, both are one year, but they are not same one year, right? So never use, unless you are very sure about the linearity, Right, sir. Never use as a quantitative. So always you either you categorize or if you're not categorizing, maybe you can you can have ten year age interval. You can yeah. have ten year ten year age interval, right? You record your age into ten year interval and give code one, two, three, four, five, and use this as a quantitative. You get one coefficient, but that one coefficient would correspond to decadal change. Right? That would correspond to decadal change. So whenever you have this kind of data and you want to use as a covariate, right? Don't use as a quantitative. You use, as I said, you divide into five categories, right? And then you use this. Training is something different. Right, training, training is something, see, whenever you have data, when you have data, one, you have training data set, then you have test data set, then you have validation mm -hmm. data set, right? Training data set is where you are training your model. Mm -hmm. And test data set within internal, that you're making sure that it doesn't memorize your data right. because your purpose is generalization. So you're using that as a check. Validation is basically whatever you have, you have seen here, are you getting same thing outside or not? That is validation. So training is just to generate the coefficients. Training is to generate the coefficients. So these are all, and validation is basically external to training data set, right? 